Hello and welcome to our online worship at Shiloh United Methodist Church on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost. This is Laity Sunday in the United Methodist Church. I'm Jerry Suit, the traditional worship coordinator here at Shiloh, and we're glad that you've tuned in to worship with us today. We hope you're blessed in this time together. Now let's invite the Lord to be with us in this time of worship. Patient and persistent God, we are grateful that even when we get sidetracked, you are with us. Be in our hearts and spirits today as we learn of your love through creation. Lord of diversity and union, we call upon you this day to open our hearts to your hope, our ears to your words, our eyes to see the needs of those both near and far, and our spirits to do your will. Be with us and give us courage and inspiration for the future of your world. O oh Lord, in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Rick Balcherson. Today, we're going to take a look at the book of Esther. You know, in my opinion, Esther would make a great Netflix series. It has it all. It has a king who's very powerful, yet easily manipulated. It has a scheming, lying, treacherous villain. It has a clever queen, a plot with unexpected twists and turns, and in the end, justice and redemption, just what we want to see. The book of Esther is unique in many ways. For one thing, we don't know exactly who wrote it. Uh, for another, God is never specifically mentioned in the book, although we do see him at work using people's imperfect plans to accomplish his perfect will. Now, there's a lot going on in this book, so let me try to summarize the action leading up to today's passage in, in just a few short minutes, and bear with me because uh, this will be relevant to what we talk about later on. So there's a lot of names and things going on here. So here we go. Xerxes, the king of Persia, one of the most powerful men in the world at that time, is giving a huge party to show off his wealth and power. Now there's lots of eating and drinking and the king, while drunk, decides it would be a great idea to show off his beautiful queen. Her name is Vashti. So the king orders Queen Vashti to come into the banquet hall and parade around to the guests who have been drinking too to show off her beauty. You know, I'm sure you can probably just picture the environment. It's probably very demeaning, maybe a little threatening. But Vasti refuses. She won't let herself be objectified. This embarrasses and enrages the king. So he gathers all of his advisors together and they figure out how they're gonna handle this situation. One of the advisors says, you know, King Xerxes, uh, Vasti just didn't offend you. She offended all the men in the kingdom. And if all the men in the kingdom if their wives don't listen to them, then where would we be? <laughs> uh, Xerxes agrees, and he decides to issue a decree deposing Queen Vashti and banishing her from his presence. A little extreme, right? He then decides to send his agents to search for other beautiful women in the kingdom, and the one he likes best will become the queen. Now, this is where we first meet Esther. She is one of the young women uh, who is brought to the king's palace. Uh, she's an orphan. She's in, living with her cousin. His name is Mordecai. And Mordecai has been taking care of her and mentoring her. Mordecai and Esther are both Jewish exiles living in a foreign land, which is Persia. And they think it's wise to keep their Jewish identity a secret. Now time passes and Esther, because of her beauty and her character, becomes the king's favorite. She is appointed as the new queen. Mordecai also becomes a court official and actually helps foil the plot of two guards who want to kill the king. An unexpected side plot. Mordecai overhears the guards. He tells Queen Esther. Esther tells the king and the guards are, well, let's just say they're dealt with. So far, so good? Okay, good. Well, now enter the villain. His name is Haman, and he's the chief official of the king. Now, he's a very proud man who likes to glorify himself and grab as much power as he can. He's offended that Mordecai won't show him the proper respect and bow down to him, so he confronts him about it. Mordecai explains that he can't do that because of his Jewish faith. He worships only God. Now this enrages Haman, who decides he wants to kill Mordecai, but wait, no, that's not enough. He doesn't want to kill just Mordecai, he wants to kill all the Jewish people living in Persia. <laughs> also a little extreme, right? Mordecai needs the king's order to do this, so he goes to the king and gives him some misleading information, telling the king that, well, there's just a certain group of people in the kingdom, that is the Jewish people, who aren't following the laws properly, and, well, they need to be dealt with. It's not safe to have them around. So the king agrees, issues a decree, and orders the Jewish people to be killed on a certain day. 
When he finds out about this, Mordecai is just devastated. He goes into mourning and he asks Esther, now the queen, to intervene. So this catches us up to today's passage. Now, if you want to find out what happens next, you're going to have to wait for season two of that Netflix series I mentioned. I think it comes out in January. Or I suppose maybe you could just read the rest of the book of Esther. That might be a little easier. But in summary, and I hope this isn't a spoiler, Esther does intervene. She speaks up. She uses her voice. It's a risky situation for her, and her success isn't guaranteed. She saves the Jewish people in what I think is a unique way. She works within the established political system, yet she also goes against societal norms a little bit. The power she holds is limited, but she uses it to make a difference. She takes Mordecai's words to heart. She realized that she was made queen for just such a time as this. She risks it all not just for herself or her family or community, but also for the good of her people. Now, this passage really speaks to my wife, Jen, and I, because we encounter situations like this every day in Cambodia and through our work at Women or Gold. Women are often objectified. Frequently, they are not heard. It's hard for them to speak up. They are subject to the constraints and expectations of a patriarchal society. And this structure is embedded in politics, in the workplace, and in many families. Unfortunately, many of the women are in abusive relationships. And many are expected at a young age to assume the responsibility of helping to support their parents rather than pursuing their own goals and dreams defying these expectations, living out their own plans and not their parents' plans can be challenging and risky for the young women. It's incredibly hard. Yet their future, their family's future, and the country's future depends on it. So that's what our nonprofit organization, Women Are Gold, encourages them to do. We believe that the young women we work with can make a big difference in their community. We want to help them find their voice, find their purpose, use their influence and special gifts to make a difference and live out God's plans for their lives. You know, in short, I think we're just in trying the girls we work with to be like Esther. So let me share a a few stories with you about how we're doing this. Uh, The first is through training and education. We provide a lot of training programs throughout the community, but we work especially close with a young group, a small group of teenage girls. These young women are from poor families and are at risk of dropping out of school to work and support their families. You know, it's not uncommon for girls to stop going to school at grade six or seven. And if the girls quit school early, They won't be able to find higher paying jobs that require more education. This in turn makes them more susceptible to accepting risky jobs or jobs where they have the potential to be exploited or abused or even trafficked. To help counteract this, we provide monthly educational support in the amount of $35 to help them pay their school fees and other education related expenses. Most of the girls we work with are at the top of their class, but they don't receive a lot of encouragement, unfortunately. We try to make sure that they and their families understand the value of education so they can complete school and step into their purpose. I want to tell you about one of these girls. We'll call her Mary, although that's not her real name. But Mary is in the ninth grade at a local Christian school. She is especially smart and gifted. Our social work manager actually calls her one in a thousand. She's always ranked number one in her class and the other girls recognize her as a natural leader. The school she attends only goes to grade nine, so she will need to go to a different high school next year. However, her current school has offered to pay the high school fees for any other school she attends, as long as she remains at the top of her class and goes to and volunteers at the local church. When she graduates from high school, they will even help pay some of her college fees 
again, assuming that she maintains her grades and continues to volunteer. Mary has a goal and a vision. She wants to be a teacher, and we have no doubt she can achieve her dream. Yet her family situation is always pushing back against this dream. Mary is the youngest of six children. Her family is extremely poor and heavily in debt. Earlier this year, her mom, who sells noodles on the Kampong Tram Riverside, had an accident that limited her ability to work. Some of Mary's brothers and sisters who work in other parts of the country um, encourage her to stop going to school and just help her mom sell the noodles on the riverside to earn money for the family. The family's debts are so large that they often talk about selling their house and land to pay off their loans. And if they do this, they would need to move to a more rural part of the country, one that's probably more affordable. However, if they move, Mary will no longer be, be able to attend that current school and participate in the community, which would cause her to lose her scholarship and most likely lose her shot at college. And now, as you may suspect, there's a, a lot of tension and arguments in the family about finances. Sometimes Mary gets overwhelmed with worry and stress about her family situation. But our staff counselor always listens to her, encourages her, and helps her believe in herself. We know she can do it, and we just wanna make sure that she knows she can do it too. Now, in addition to providing encouragement and school support for Mary, our team also works with Mary's family to help them develop a plan for handling their finances and managing their debts. And this leads me to another solution we provide, which is our personal finances training program. Debt is a big problem in Cambodia. Many families we work with have multiple loans and they just struggle to make ends meet. Some families take out loans to pay off their existing loans. And then when they get into trouble with that, they'll take out another loan on top of that. This only accelerates their cycle of debt. Last year, we began offering a training program called Managing Your Personal Finances. This is an easy to understand, practical program that teaches money management skills and financial literacy. The training program has proven to be our most popular session, both with our own clients and their families, as well as our community partners. We even get requests from people we don't know in the community asking us to perform this training for them. In our personal finances class, we show our clients and their families how to avoid this type of debt trap. Participants learn how to budget, save money, prioritize spending, and pay off debts. At the end of the session, each family develops a personalized finance plan that they can use as a blueprint to achieve financial freedom. And our thinking is that if a family can manage its debt, the girls can stay in school. Again, this reduces the likelihood that they will be forced into jobs where they are exploited, abused, or trafficked. Now, Mary's family situation is still a work in progress. It's not a happily ever after situation yet. At the moment, though, they backed off their plan to sell their house and their land. They've also taken our personal finances class, and Mary's dad has found a new job that pays a bit more money. We'll continue to work with this family and our hope is that we can help them navigate their current challenges and help Mary continue to pursue her dream. Now, another solution we provide is helping to keep kids safe online. Online scams and online predators are also big concerns in Cambodia, you know, just like they are in our own country. So we realized we needed a way to find a way to help keep young girls and boys safe on the internet. Working in partnership with A21, another anti-trafficking organization, we lead training sessions at local schools using a very unique and interactive online game called May and Bay. This is, a, like I said, a unique and age-appropriate tool that helps young people learn how to spot the signs of online grooming and make the right decisions to avoid dangerous online activities. Mordecai and Esther 
recognize the importance of being wise and diligent to keep themselves and their community safe. In the same way, we're using this training program to help kids make wise decisions and protect themselves when they are online. You know, when we first went to Cambodia, we had a vision and a plan. However, when we began meeting with community leaders, hiring staff, and learning about the actual needs on the ground, we learned that our plan would have to change a little bit. Now, our vision remains the same, to prevent human trafficking and work in partnership with the community to develop solutions. But honestly, if we hadn't adjusted our plan, we probably would have failed by now. We're all, we've always realized that we can't prevent trafficking or impact the community on our own. We need to work with others. So we formed a network of local government leaders, churches, schools, and other organizations to help do this. But I think our biggest asset is our staff. We have Vuta, Piap, Danny, and Milan. They work fearlessly and tirelessly to help encourage and empower the young women in our community. We're so blessed to work with them side by side and are truly grateful for all that they do. Finally, we want to mention a unique book study that we've launched in partnership with local churches in the past year. This book is called Diving Deep, Going Far. It's a reality novel about a new generation of women leaders in Cambodia. It's based on interviews with over 25 young Cambodian women. And Diving Deep, Going Far tells the stories of four main characters, each of whom are a composite of multiple real women. This novel is amazing and inspiring. I first read it when it came out in 2018 and I just thought it was fantastic. It challenges the girls to dream big, recognize their worth and value, and take concrete steps to reach their goals. In the last chapter of the book, one of the characters whose name is Nika, who is a musician, says this. I wrote my first album because I wanted to inspire other girls and women to talk about their stories, just like I was talking about mine. Women in our country have been silent for far too long. We get beat up by our boyfriends and husbands every day, and as long as we don't talk about it, things like that will never change. So I wanted to set an example. I wanted to show that no matter what your story is, you don't have to be ashamed of it. Everyone can be brave in that way. It's a mistake to think you have to be special to speak up. It should be normal. This album is about right here, right now. It's inspired by my fans, our country's youth. Did you know that more than half of our country is under 25 years old? This is our time, this generation. We're ready to shape our future, and that makes us different from all the previous generations here. Wow, doesn't that sound familiar? Just as Esther realized that her time is now, that she was appointed queen for just such a time as this, so many young women in Cambodia are coming of age and are poised to make a positive, lasting, systematic change on their lives, their families' lives, and the country's lives. And our organization exists to help them do that to help them change their story and step into that bright, hope-filled future. Thank you, Shiloh, for helping us. We can't do it alone, but together, collectively, and with God's help, we, when I say we, I mean all of us, are making a life-changing difference. We're keeping girls in school. We're building hope and wholeness in the community. We're offering God's gift of oneness. We appreciate your ongoing prayers, encouragement, and support, and we can't wait to see what the new year brings. Thanks again for your partnership, and God bless.